morning, church family. Welcome to Christchurch Hillcrest on this very chilly morning. Uh, I see we, we don't have lots of people this morning, so I think some of them are still on holiday, and some have followed my mother's example and stayed in bed. <laughs> so I went to go and check this morning and said, are you ready? She wasn't even awake. So she's, she's where I think most of us wish we, wish we were. So if everyone can bow their heads, we'll be open in prayer. Go before us, God, in all our doings with your most gracious favour, and grant us your constant help that all your works begun, continued, and ended in you. We may glorify your holy name, and by your mercy receive everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As you know, this morning is a communion service, so you should all have received um, your little cards. If you don't, do you want to, there are some at the door. Um, does everybody have one? Okay, so we'll start with the gathering in God's name. I'll read the first part that is not in bold, and then if you can follow with the, the part that starts Almighty God um, in bold when we get to that section. Okay, so does everybody have one? You ready? We have come here to take part in the worship of God, to confess our sins to him and to ask for his forgiveness, to thank him for making us and protecting us, to praise him for his love and mercy, to hear from his holy word, and to pray for our deeds and needs of others. But first let us confess our sins and say together, Almighty God, Heavenly Father, we confess that we have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and deeds, and in what we have left undone. Lord, have mercy on us. Forgive us our sins and help us that we may serve you better and please you more. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Good morning, church family. Let's incline our hearts to pray this morning. Would you bow with me? Before we start, let King David's words from the Psalms guide us into an attitude of prayer. He says, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations, for your steadfast love is great above the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all the earth. Let's pray. Oh, yes, gracious Heavenly Father, would it be today that your glory be over all the earth, your power and greatness displayed to beyond the heavens, for all is the wonderful works of your hands. O oh, awesome creator, God of light, for where you are there is no darkness, nothing moves that is under your direction, and how blessed are we to be under your grace. Through the sending of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, our Lord, the Head of the Church, the one in whom you are well pleased to have your fullness dwell, who reigns supreme over all things, and in him all things hold together. Yes, for at a time we were all in darkness, so lost, so undeserving, so in need of your forgiveness. But for your act, Lord Jesus, upon that cross, your blood that was shed for us, and as we approach your table this morning, partaking of the cup and the breaking of the bread, may we acknowledge appropriately this so great a sacrifice. For today those who do so and confess their sins shall be to them removed as far as the east is from the west. And we again can worship you with pure hands and clean hearts to be so humbled in awe of this your immeasurable grace. Thank you, Father. Thank you for you are worthy more than we could humanly express. This beautiful morning, let us honor you. Let us praise you in our hearts with thanksgiving, rejoicing in the many blessings you so graciously provide and that we so comfortably have come to expect. For it is in this just how quickly and easily we forget around us there are so many in tribulations, battling sicknesses and sorrows, poverty and other injustices. 
the discouraging realities of a life within a sinful and dark world. For the world needs you, as in today we need you, lifting those within our church family, and to intentionally and individually take hold of those in our thoughts, for you to supernaturally intervene, our God. Have mercy. You are to them and us a guardian and a refuge. You are the ultimate source of strength in their hour of trial. Hear them who wait patiently for understanding on your intended purpose. For in this we know you, our God, work for the good of those who love you and have been called according to your purpose. Yes, your purpose, Father. As we pray for our nation and the ones who govern us, lead them away from worldly provocations of acceptability, corruption and mismanagement, but raise up within them dynamic persons focused on serving the people, imposing again morals and values that uphold truth and serve to bring honor to you. Your purpose too for our denomination, Reach SA, George Whitfield College, the many other humble servants only known to you serving in forgotten places, to the ones institutionalized, incarcerated, the frail, let the doors be continually open to them so they may be about your work, yes, your incredible work of salvation. For as it is written, blessed are the feet of those who bring the message of salvation, for our own in Jomo and his family, Thor, Sunday school teachers, the Bible study leaders, and this morning our guest speaker, Stuart. And bless us as a church family, those that are away on holiday, grant them rest and safe traveling mercies and return them safely to us. Oh yes, Father, bless again now our speaker with great power of the Holy Spirit as we anticipate the message for what happens now matters. And what is to come, our hearts but can only imagine, may it seek to challenge us as the day of reckoning approaches. Set our lives in order before you and renew our commitment to love and obedience, usefulness and faithfulness. Be honored through our lives, we pray in the mighty name of Jesus, the one who was and is and will be evermore. Amen. Good morning, church family. Let's read from the Word of God. Luke 14, starting at verse 12. He said also to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you. You will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. When one of these who has reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a field, and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and the lanes of the city and bring in the poor and crippled and blind and lame. And the servant said to him, Sir, what you have commanded has been done and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be filled. For I tell you, None of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. This is the word of God. 
Well, thank you. It's, it's, it's wonderful to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I heard that you have uh, amazing coffee and that's why I, I came, uh, only to find that your baristas are on holiday now, so I feel already shortchanged. Um, no, it's, it's really wonderful to be with you in, in Chillcrest. Uh, I was feeling quite proud of myself because uh, I was ready to say that, you know, I've survived uh, probably the coldest day of the year in the coldest part of Durban, only to find Anna Marie say, this is just warming up to, to the real winter. Um, but yeah, here we are. Um, yeah, I want to just open in a word of prayer. And then if you keep your Bible open in front of you to Luke chapter 14, verses 12 to 24, that would be a great help to me because uh, I haven't come yet to share my opinion. Uh, but like Jomo, we, we preach from God's word. And so you can test it and see that it's true. Uh, will you bow with me as we pray? Father, we thank you that no matter how many times this happens, it is truly miraculous. It is an encounter with you, the divine, a transcendent experience, because we are going to hear the living God speak to us. And so we pray, Father, that we would sit up in anticipation of that that you would give us a humility uh, to learn, to listen, that you would eradicate all distractions, that the seed of your word would not be snatched away, but would be planted deeply in our hearts, that it would go from our ears down into our hearts, and from our hearts there would be a deep change by your Holy Spirit, so that we may live lives uh, that glorify you, and that love our neighbor. For Jesus' sake, we pray this. Amen. Well, C.S. Lewis, I'm sure you've heard of him. He was a, a famous um, uh, lecturer and uh, also a Christian apologist. And he uh, once was asked to address a group of university students, uh, people who had the world at their feet. Um, and his lecture was called The Inner Ring. And uh, perhaps you've read it. He, he, he made the, the claim in that lecture, and I quote, that one of the most dominant elements in every person's life is the desire to be inside the local ring and the terror of being left outside. Now, now what Lewis calls the ring are those people in the know. Uh, they are those at the center of an organization or a group. They are those, to, to kind of mix my metaphors, that are highest on the ladder. And I think that Lewis really gets at something here by saying that we all have that desire. You know, so much of the way we live our life comes down to wanting to be included and not to be excluded. We've all felt that terror of being left outside at one time or another in our lives, to be, to be forgotten or to be overlooked, to be considered of of little value to this group of people. I wonder how you have experienced that for yourself. Perhaps it was in an interview uh, for a job that you really wanted and you, you put yourself out there, you made yourself vulnerable, but they didn't call you back. Maybe it was a group of friends that you were getting to know and you thought things were going well, but they just began to drop comments that suggested you don't really belong, you don't really fit in. Maybe they sidelined you or started to avoid your calls. Or perhaps uh, just a group of people that you used to be able to hang out with, uh, go on holidays with, live in the same neighborhood, but you can no longer afford that anymore. We all hate being made to feel excluded, and we avoid it at all costs. To say it the other way around, we long to be on the inside, uh, to be one of the people who are in the know, to feel that, that warm glow of being looked at and seen and valued. Now, we, we all know what those areas are in our lives, in your life, where you are just determined to be in the inner ring. Um, I don't know what that is for you. Perhaps it's that you, you want that work promotion. And you'll do whatever it takes uh, to get it. Maybe you want your kids to, to go to the right schools. 
uh, to have the right alumni and, and you'll even sell a kidney if you have to, if, to, to afford it. Uh, maybe you want uh, the latest uh, iPhone or, or, or car uh, so that you can keep up with what is trendy and have status. But Lewis says that if you play this game long enough, soon you'll discover that what you thought was the inner ring is really just one layer of an onion and that there is another ring inside of that one and another inside of that. And so we spend our lives trying to move deeper and deeper into the center to be one layer closer, uh, to be higher up on the ladder. Now, if we've been preaching through the book of Luke, we'll immediately you'd know who I'm talking about uh, because that, that is exactly the way that the Pharisees, the religious leaders of Jesus' day, lived their lives. They were the inner ring. They played the game better than anyone else. They were at the top of the spiritual ladder. And so what Jesus does is he tells this parable, is he takes aim at them. He is warning them that if they continue to play by the rules of the inner ring, that they are actually in danger of excluding themselves from God's kingdom. And so look at, look at how our passage ends in verse 24. This is what Jesus says to them. He says, I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Very strong words. Jesus here is teaching a spiritual truth that everyone we should all take seriously. When it comes to God's kingdom, those who think that they are at the front of the queue might just be surprised to find out that they are at the back. And so Jesus, in love, he fires this warning shot across the bow, and he wants us to sit up and take this to heart. So in this passage, we join Jesus at a dinner party it's a dinner party of a very prominent Pharisee. You can, you can see that if you look at verse 1 of, of, of our chapter. One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. So the Pharisees are carefully watching Jesus at this party. Why? Because they're trying to, to trap him. They already have hostility towards them. But while they're watching him, he is actually watching them very carefully. And he had worked out how the game of the inner ring was being played at this dinner party, and he couldn't take it any longer. And so look at verse 12. Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back. And so you will be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. It's quite a bold thing to say at a party where all, he's invited all of his friends and his rich neighbors and his Pharisees and his colleagues. And Jesus is saying, why are all these people here? Where are the lame, the poor, the blind? Those kinds of people. He's saying, you know what you're showing? You're showing that your way of living is you pat my back, I pat yours. That's what this party is all about. That's how the world thinks. But that's not how things work in the kingdom of God. See, these Pharisees claim to be at the very front of the kingdom of God, but they don't even understand this. So you can imagine the awkward silence after Jesus just kind of drops this bomb uh, in this party. No one knew what to say. No one knew how to respond to this. But of course, there is always that one guy at the party who thinks that he knows what to say. And this is what he says in verse 15. One of those at the table with him heard this. He said to Jesus, Blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. This is one of those religious Cliches. It's just something you say when you don't know what to say. Maybe like at a funeral when you feel you must say something, 
Uh, and so you say, well, I'm, I'm sure that Uncle Bob is, is in a better place right now. You know, maybe he's playing golf and uh, having a great time. To which everyone kind of says, you know, amen, they nod their head uh, before we just like quickly change the topic. That's kind of what's going on here. But, but Jesus is not going to do that. Uh, he, he wasn't going to just nod along, sit there. Because while this man is, is right that the one who is part of this, this heavenly kingdom feast, they are blessed. Jesus knows what, what this man is actually saying is, we here around this table are the ones who are blessed because we're, we're obviously going to be at that kingdom feast. And so Jesus tells this parable because he wants to challenge that way of thinking. He wants to challenge their confidence that they are in the kingdom of God. And so the first thing he does is he paints a picture of heaven as an unmissable party. That's our first point. An unmissable party. Look at verse 16. A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who'd been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. I wonder, what, what is your view of heaven? Uh, what comes to your mind when you think about it? I think for a, a lot of people, their view of heaven is, is a bit like space. You know, it's just kind of bobbing in nothingness. For others, it, it might be that it's, it's a bit like a church service that maybe goes on for too long and the, the pews are too hard and the coffee's too weak or, or there's no coffee at all because the baristas are on holiday. If that's heaven, I, I don't really want to go there myself. But Jesus says, no, no, you want to know what heaven is like? It's like the greatest party that you could ever imagine. And in the back of his mind was, was probably a verse in the Old Testament like Isaiah 25, verse 6, which does describe heaven that way. It's a beautiful picture. It says this, On this mountain the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. That is a party. Multitudes of people enjoying the widest spread of the best food and drink. It's a place of laughter and celebration like all the best parties are, of entertainment and singing, of contentment and belonging. This is the kind of party that no one would dare to miss. But maybe that's a new thought to you, that Jesus would describe heaven as a party. Why does he want us to think of heaven that way? Well, someone has said, and I think they're right, it's because when you're at a party, your hunger is satisfied, your thirst is quenched for as long as you're there, for as long as it goes on. What is that saying? It's saying that to be in the eternal company of God is to have your every desire met, is to have that void completely filled, that all that we were made for, all that we hunger and thirst after in this life but never quite arrive at it, one day that is going to be satisfied to the fullest measure forever. It is the party to end all parties, and anyone would be crazy to miss out on it. In verse 16 and 17, we are told that the guests here, they basically receive two invitations to this party. Uh, the initial invites are sent out weeks in advance, and this is how they would do parties back then. It was, it was kind of like a save the date, the way we do today. And then people would RSVP so that the host knows like how many people to cater for. And when all the preparations were done, uh, a second invite would be sent out to call everyone to the feast. Okay, it's now ready. You can come. And it would have been very clear to the, the religious leaders what Jesus has been referring to in telling this parable so far. 
See, God represents the host of this party. And the first invite went out to the Jewish people. It is the Old Testament where God made promises to them. He sent prophets to tell them to get ready for his coming kingdom, for the king, the Messiah, who was going to come. And they kept saying, yes, we will. We'll be ready when it comes. So finally, everything is ready. The day arrives. The Lord Jesus comes from heaven to earth. He is sent out like the servant to say, come, everything is now ready. I am God's promised king. I have come to welcome you in to God's kingdom. An unmissable party, free, ready to be enjoyed. That's what's on offer here. Until Jesus now takes a turn in the story quite unexpectedly. And he brings these Pharisees face to face with themselves. Because he says, when he comes as the king to welcome them in, some people don't respond to the invite the way they should. They come up with outrageous excuses. And that's our second point, is outrageous excuses. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Now, no one buys a field before they've actually gone and looked at it. So this guy really knows what his field looks like. In any case, the field is still going to be there the next day. It's not like it's going anywhere. So it's not the best excuse, is it? But he says, no, my possessions come first. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Again, you you would hope that after making such a big investment like five oxen that that he's he's seen them already and seen what condition they're in. So surely that can wait as well. This is not really pressing. But no, this agricultural businessman chooses to make his work his main priority. And still another said, well, I just got married, uh, so I can't come. Uh, Getting married, I don't think, is something that happens out of the blue, uh, unless you are in Las Vegas and you've had too much to drink. Uh, You you tend to plan for it months in advance. I mean, you can imagine inviting someone to to a braai in two weeks' time, and and they say, yes, I'll be there, very keen. You call them up uh, the night of the the braai, and you say, the day of the braai, and you say, I'll I'll see you tonight. And then they say, oh, yeah, um, about that, you know, the funniest thing happened. I actually got married uh, a couple of days ago. Really? Yeah, you know, I, j- I just completely forgot to mention it. Uh, but I really, really would have loved to to come. Now we've all had those those kinds of situations where these outrageous excuses come up, and we know what they're really saying, right? Something else is it more important to me than spending time with you? Behind each of these excuses is a priority towards something other than the company of the master. And these excuses, I, I think, are, they give us three of maybe the biggest areas of, of life that can drag people away from the kingdom of God. Our possessions, our work, and our relationships. Now, those are all good things. Jesus is not trying to to demean those. He's not saying that they're bad. They are good gifts God gives us to enjoy. But he is saying that to want those things more than the one who's given them is to have our priorities back to front. The, The religious leaders may look as if they are living for God's kingdom. They may say all the right things, But Jesus tells them in no uncertain terms, they're actually not. They've got their priorities back to front. They are much more concerned with growing their little kingdoms here 
and now. Getting deeper into the inner ring, moving higher up on the ladder, and Jesus is a threat to that, and so they don't want him around. More possessions, greater status, longer work hours. I wonder if you were at this dinner party, what would Jesus say about your life? Maybe, like the religious leaders, you look as if you're living for God's kingdom, might even be at church every Sunday, but your life suggests otherwise. And we can so easily fool ourselves here because at first we say that we just don't have the time. When things calm down on the work front, well, then I'll get back to the things of God. Or when things are a little bit less hectic in my marriage or with my children, then I will make time for kingdom things. That goes on for long enough until some people eventually realize, maybe they don't say it out loud, that there will always be new work demands, that there will always be pressing family issues. There will always be excuses. The thing is that we always find time for the things that are truly important to us, no matter how busy we are. And so eventually, you may need to confront the reality that Jesus is warning of here. That maybe the problem is that you really don't want a relationship with God. That we are not spiritually hungering after him. That we are actually satisfied our appetites on the things of this world. And if that is you this morning, Jesus says in love, watch out that you don't exclude yourself from the feast. Now at this point, the the master in the parable is obviously very angry. You can see that in verse 21 because he's, he's sent out these invitations and no one's come. Every single person has turned it down. He has a house full of food and no one to enjoy it with. And so this is where Jesus really gets under the skin of the religious leaders. Because instead of postponing the party till the right people are there, the servant is now told to go out and to find some unexpected replacements. And that's our third point. Unexpected replacements. Verse 21. Go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out to the roads and country lanes and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. See, it's, it's shocking enough for Jesus to suggest that the, the, the religious insiders might be excluded from this party, but now it is a scandal to say that outcasts in Jewish society can be included, can be welcomed in. And I think that there are, there are really two groups of people that Jesus is talking about here. Uh, the first group of these outsiders are in verse 20, 21. It says you can find them uh, in the streets, in the back alleys of the city. They, they are not at the heart of the city in the offices and the fancy restaurants. They are the poor, the crippled, the blind, the lame. Those in Jewish society that were pushed to the margins. In other words, they are the needy who know that they are needy. And did you notice that in verse 22, as soon as the invite goes out, they accept it. They found their feet already because they know that they are needy. They didn't need to be asked twice. Uh, There wasn't all these things that they had in the world that were consuming their time and their loves. They were spiritually hungry. They were ready to be filled by God and his free food. Uh, Some years ago, I took a, a gap year and I did some sailing and on one of my trips, uh, we arrived in the Seychelles. And we docked at this fancy new marina, which was called Eden Island. 
it was a, a luxury um, estate where the, the super wealthy were, were buying up plots and they were erecting these beautiful villas uh, and had their own boats. And uh, one night my friend and I were, were on our yacht and we were preparing to, to have another meal of smash and bully beef. <laughs> Uh, when we heard music coming from the, the clubhouse, it turns out that de the developers were throwing a party for prospective buyers. And uh, my friend had this crazy idea that we should go and, and we should crash this party. So uh, in walked these, these two rough-looking 18-year-olds uh, with our damp, creased jeans and our long, messy hair. There was... Uh, no money in our pockets, certainly not enough to buy any property. And we were, I guess, kind of hoping to just blend in. <laughs> uh, after we'd been looked up and down by a few of the, the wealthy guests, the director of Eden Island, uh, who was a South African, interestingly enough, uh, comes up to us and uh, he asks the obvious question, you know, what are you guys doing here? And uh, we didn't really have a plan of what to say at that point, um, but we saw that they had lovely South African food there. There was pap and buravos, and we said that, you know, we'd been sailing for months. We haven't had a proper South African meal. He looked at us, he smiled, and then he said, have whatever you want and as much as you want. And so we did. <laughs> And I have to say, it was one of the greatest nights of my life. That is what Jesus says the kingdom of God is like. That you don't have to climb up the ladders. You don't have to be in the inner ring. You don't have to have status or money or the right connections. That the kingdom is open to all who would come and eat for free. The only qualification for being at God's party is that you accept the invitation. That's it. The master says, come, for everything is ready. Nothing needs to be done. All you need to do is bring your hunger and your thirst. You can come and feast for free. That is what the Bible calls grace. A free gift for the taking. And religious people hate it. The Pharisees hated it. Because what it is saying is all of those inner rings, all of those hierarchies that you've created for yourselves, really that is all for nothing. All of my good deeds are worthless. They cannot get me into heaven. And if you come to this feast, what you have to accept is that you will be on the same level as those who are poor, crippled, blind, and lame. You have to admit that you are spiritually needy. And for religious people, that is a very hard thing to do. The second group of people are in verse 23. Now, they are even further outside of, of the city. They are in the countrysides now. Most commentators think that, that here Jesus is is, is talking about the non-Jews, the Gentiles. Uh, the Gentiles, as we know, they weren't even of the same religion. Uh, they worshipped their own gods, and the Jew was taught that they were unclean, and that under no circumstances would you eat with a Gentile. But here, the way Jesus is telling the story, he has the audacity to suggest to these Pharisees that even Gentiles will be invited to eat at the table in the kingdom of God. The text says that the servant is going to need to compel them to come in. Now, why is that? You know, are they like the religious leaders? Uh, they, they're making excuses because they don't really want to come. Is that why they need to be compelled? No, I think that the reason they need to be compelled is because they are so surprised to receive the invitation. It's so unexpected that they wonder, maybe if the, the servant has made a mistake, that the party must be for someone else. Someone who, who loves God more than I do. Someone whose life looks better than mine. And so the servant has to persuade them 
No, no, the kingdom of God is for you. God wants you in his kingdom. And maybe someone here needs to be persuaded of that this morning. That no matter what you have prioritized above God, no matter how much you've ignored him, no matter how many times you've, you've shaken your fist in his face, he wants you at his table. There is a place for you. He wants his house to be full of people to enjoy his company forever. The very fact that you feel unworthy, the very fact that you feel like you have nothing to bring to the table is what qualifies you to be at the table. If you would accept this invitation, if you would come, and if you would eat for free. I don't know if there's anyone here who uh, would call themselves a, a, an unbeliever, but if you are, it's wonderful that you could come, and uh, please do think about that, joining this feast, this heavenly banquet. And if you, if you want to think more about how to do that, you can chat to, to Jomo or someone who, who might have brought you along. The feast is free for us, but it is still paid for by someone else, by the Lord Jesus Christ, and that wasn't cheap. The reason that the master could say to us, come for everything is now ready, is because as Jesus hung on the cross, he could say, it is finished. What that means is that he has paid for it in full. It's free for us because it cost him everything. We're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper just now. I didn't know that we were going to do that, but it's thrilling because I wanted to speak about that. The most expensive meal in history is the Lord's Supper. Jesus took the bread in his hands and he tore it apart to show how his body would be torn apart on the cross. He took the wine and he poured it out to show how his blood would be poured out for us. See, Jesus was torn apart so that we could be fed. He was poured out so that our thirst could be quenched. It cost him everything so that it could be free for us. And when we celebrate the Lord's Supper, that is just the rehearsal. That is just the practice for the great heavenly banquet that awaits us one day when we will have all of our longings all of our desires satisfied because we will be with our master in his presence and it will be a day when i think we will look back on all of our possessions on our work status on our relationships in this life and not one of us will say i really should have spent more time pursuing those things so as we look ahead to the heavenly banquet, what will shape your week this week? Uh, will it be a fear of being excluded? Will it be keeping up with the lifestyle of maybe your friends? Will it be doing everything you can at work to get into that inner ring? Or will it be shaped by the fact that you've been included, if you trust in the Lord Jesus, in the only thing that will matter for all eternity, Will you be in the company of the master? Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you that you are a gracious God. That you have done everything necessary to set a table for us. That we might come to enjoy fellowship with you, the one that we were made for. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ, that he gave his body, that he shed his blood, that we might eat and drink for everlasting life. And we pray, Lord, that you would forgive us when we so easily make other things, temporary things, things that are passing away, things that cannot truly satisfy us, when we make those things our main priorities. We get so distracted and so caught up in them. We get so anxious about them. We get so greedy for more of them that we forget this. So bring some of us back, Lord, to our first love 
Help us to put you above all these things and to trust in you. For Jesus' sake, amen.